When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in, and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Where, you know, as America was beginning to turn from God, when they started removing, this is, what, this is what happened with Israel, started removing prayer, early 60s, the word, these are all these things that cast the gods out. So if you remove them, then what's going to happen? You're opening the door for the repossession. You're opening the door. So it's ne- the house is not going to stay empty. Something else is coming in. If you take this out of school, well, something else is coming into the schools. Something else is coming to the children. That's what we have been witnessing. And now the first God, or the first principality, the one who always begins it, his name, his name actually means the possessor. In the book, I call him the possessor. In, in the Bible, it says Baal. Baal means Baal. the possessor. Yeah, we call, you know him as Baal. Baal, he is the possessor. So the first thing, his job, what he did with ancient Israel, is he caused them to forget their God. And he caused them to start driving God out. The spirit of Baal in America in the West, has been driving God out. So we said the schools we have, we have uh, from culture. Literally, the Bible says he caused them to turn away from the commandments. Literally in America, we have actually cast down the Ten Commandments. Same thing. So what we are watching, it's the repaganization of America. His job or his mission of this prison is to take a Christ, a quote, Christian nation or Judeo-Christian nation and turn it into a pagan nation. And that is exactly what has been happening. And he is the first spirit. You know, it says the spirit comes and says, let me get my friends. So from there's some, by the way, say, we're just touching on it, of course. There's so much to this. Of but, but it's affected everything. In fact, there's one thing. The, Baal actually, man, I won't go into it, actually manifested in New York City. The sign of Baal massively. We won't go into it. But the thing is that he is the first spirit. And so he's the one who says, now the other gods are going to come in through that, and that's what exactly what has happened. Is it possible that the gods lie behind everything from what appears on our computer monitors, our television, movie screens, the lessons given to our children in their classrooms, the breakdown of the family, the wokeism to cancel culture, children's cartoons, to every force and factor that has transformed the parameters of gender? Is it possible that behind all these things are ancient mysteries going back to the ancient Middle East. Yes. Well, what, what is the name in, in the uh, Bible? In the Bible, she's called Ashtoreth. She, in, in Mesopotamia, she's called Ishtar. When she went into the Greek land, she was called Aphrodite, and then Venus. She is all over. Hmm. And she's mentioned specifically there. Now, in the, in the Canaanite mythology, she's actually the wife of Baal. So Baal has a wife. Okay? And so, so when Baal comes, the next one to come, it says in the Bible, it says Baal, then it says Ashtoreth. Then she's coming in. So what this means is once the door is open, she is the goddess of sexuality, of sexual immorality. She's the goddess. She's actually called a prostitute. She's a goddess who, who her temples were filled with, with sexuality. All, it was made, made it public. So if she returns, what would happen? If she comes out, it means that America is under, going to undergo a sexual revolution. Hmm. That, is the, that is the sign of the possession of Ishtar or this goddess. And the thing is, so sex comes, she, what she did, what a prostitute is, is she, she, actually, she actually damages marriage. She actually weakens marriage. That's what, that's what happens. Brings sexuality into the culture. In ancient times in Israel, she, in the Middle East, she put her images of naked people all over the culture. And so not only she was in her Greek form, she gave birth to a, to a child named Eros. We get the word erotica. So erotica starts flooding America. She, the word for prostitute, which is what she was, in her Greek incarnation is the word porne. We get the word porn from it. So there's an explosion of pornography all over the culture. So what Baal does, in one sense, she's repaganized. She's overturning biblical standards of sexuality and marriage, and she is paganizing our culture through sexuality and through possessing it. And she's also the goddess of spells and witchcraft. Hmm. So she casts her spell on America, and we are still in it to this day. It's irrational. It's, it's not natural at all. Yeah. And it goes further, Sid, because, because something strange about the goddess 
and that is that has to do with gender. Because what she also did, let me tell you, in her ancient inscriptions, I'm looking at these ancient inscriptions, she says, I am a woman, I am a man. It says, this is, it's said in her, in, in her hymns, it says, she has the power to transform a man into a woman and a woman into a man. So, so what's going to wow. happen? What's going to happen if she comes into the culture? You're going to start seeing what she's going to do is she's going to start she's going to start masculinizing women, defeminizing women, and feminizing men. That that touches everything. I mean, it touches our culture, touches our the roles, touches radical feminism and sexuality. And so, so all this stuff that we're having, saying, how could this happen? This is all the goddess. This is all. It's all there. Uh, when, how in the world did you figure all of this out? Well, well, I don't, I don't take any credit for figuring it. It's just something God shows me one thing, and then the next thing, the next thing, I'm like, I'm the first one to be blown away by it. And, 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 and Sidney even goes further. She had a priesthood. Her priests, listen to this, in her temples, were, they were men who dressed up as women. And they, 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 they acted as women dressed up. So what's going to happen if she comes back? What's going to happen is, as she possesses a culture, is that men will start dressing, will start seeing that in our culture, which we do. These are her ancient priesthood. Also, they were involved in same-sex sexuality. We see that explosion as well. Also, it says, remember, she says she turns men into women, transitions them and women into men. Her priest, many of her priests were actually surgically altered. She caused really? them to be surgically altered. I never altered. knew that. Yes. I thought that was just something of our gender. Well, we do it more sophisticated, but this is why I wrote this book. This is to reveal and arm believers and to know what's happening. And she especially, all the gods, but she goes after, they go after the children. Because if you have the children, you have the future. And so that happened in ancient times, happening now. And so you think, what would possess a, a, an adult to do this to children? Well, what would possess it? The spirit. This is what, this, the spirit of the goddess. Hmm. And I, I'm going to go even far, farther, because this is mind-boggling. And that is that the goddess was in charge, which she was a goddess of parades. She had parades hmm. happening all over. And when I looked at the ancient inscriptions of the parades, it describes them, and it says, it says in the parades, the men would dress up as women in the parades, hmm. the women would dress as a men, it would be a parade of gender bending, and that's exactly what, when you see this happening now, that's the sign of the goddess. And, Sid, it's even like more mind-boggling, because I'm looking at this, and I look at the ancient, the ancient observers, and they said, when did this thing happen? They said it happened, even St. Jerome, it happened in the month they called it in, in Latin, Junium. June was the month of the goddess. She claimed a month, June, and she was the goddess of pride. So we have now a pride month. It's all come back. This is going to be through these things, through these festivals, she possesses a culture. And, that, and that's the sign that she has come back. Now, you say the gods are even influencing the yes. rulings of the Supreme Court, yes. and they've determined the exact timing yes. of those rulings? Yeah, this blew me away. Yes. Yeah. Since these things happened, there's been three landmark cases that have to do with gender and, you know, all, all these things, same sex and, and marriage. The first one was in 2003, had to do with legalizing. It happened in the, month, the ancient month of Tammuz. That's the lover of Ishtar. That's her month. That's her month. It happened, happened at the exact time, happened at the exact date of the goddess. The next one happened in 2013, struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. That happened same month, same exact day, month of the goddess, time of the summer solstice, all these pagan things. The last one, which struck down marriage, we all remember that. That happened month of the goddess, days of the goddess, same time, same date, June 26th, and Sid. Remember, remember when marriage was changed. Remember when that happened. We all remember it. That night, all over America, rainbows appear. And one of them appears on the White House. Remember that? We all, we all remember. Well, that, the, that night on the ancient calendar, I looked this up in the Bible, was the night that is, a, is appointed, the 10th of Tammuz, appointed, appointed to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man on that day. Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives. That's where you go to support this mission of truth. That audio clip that you just listened to was actually from a video um, that I watched that was put together by KJ from the scariest movie uh, ever YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that full video that he posted a few days ago uh, if I can remember uh, in the comments on the YouTube channel uh, but Jonathan that was Jonathan Kahn and he's just he's talking about that principle of that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 12 when Jesus is talking to that generation 
that wicked generation that would be judged for rejecting for rejecting him and for all kinds of other things. And he spoke of that generation, um, and he talked about how he talked about the principle. It's it's like you'll be indwelled with something, whether it be the truth of God or whether it be wicked spirits. And he taught, he uses this like an analogy of a house. And so if, let's say you have a wicked spirit in the house and you get rid of it, but then that's, that house remains empty. The wicked spirit will then go grab more wicked spirits more wicked than itself, and return to the imp- the house that is now empty, because it was never filled with something else. And now the state of the house, the state of the person, is worse than it was when it was just the one evil spirit. And he's uh, making the connection that. We were once a foundationally a Christian nation. And now it seems clear based on all the symbolism, based on everything going on that something else is in charge, right? Like that's, that's kind of the feeling and that's kind of uh, what he's, uh, the point that he's trying to make. You know, what we've definitely seen is a ramp up in Satanism and in, in the worship of false gods and the Babylonian spirit. I saw this article the other day called Atheists Are More Religious Than Christians. And it's got a picture of Beyonce as like the, the at the top. And she's in that weird sun goddess worship outfit with people that, with that symbolism. And when I read articles like that, I'm like, they're not atheist. <laughs> like, that's where you're getting it wrong. They're not atheist. They believe in these gods. And they openly worship these gods. And we're foolish enough to think that they're atheist. They're not. There's very... When it comes to the people who are in the... What you would call the ruling class or the elite... I don't think we should give them such pleasant names... They're they're not atheists. They're worshiping. They're just not worshiping the one true God. They're worshiping these other gods. Interestingly enough, I was kind of just glancing through. I didn't know if I wanted to talk about this today, and so I was glancing through Corinthians, which we will just study next week, uh, looking at chapter eight. Because so I was thinking about, you know what? I'm just going to do Corinthians. I'm not going to get into this mess. Uh, we just did a prophecy podcast earlier this week. I get a few verses in to chapter 8, and here's what Paul's dealing with idol worship. And he gets, uh, we get to verse 5 in chapter 8, and he says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. And so Paul is not denying that there is these other gods. And they're little, God's little g, you know, they're demonic manifestations. He's acknowledging that they do exist. It is, it is Paul that tells us that we're not even at war with flesh and blood. That are actually at war with principalities and powers in high places. I'll get back to kind of what Jonathan Kahn was saying about America here in a second. Let me read to you. We read part of this the other day talking about something else uh, in our podcast earlier this week about how it'll be worse for this generation than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus was saying that to the generation of his day that rejected him. And of course, one of the most horrific things in the history of God's people happened in 70 AD when the Romans came in. They slaughtered him. Blood was running in the streets. 
uh, the temple was torn down. It was it was horrific judgment, and you can read uh, the history of that stuff. Josephus does a good job of covering everything that happened. A Jewish historian. But Jesus is talking to that generation in chapter 12 of the book of Matthew. And he says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak shall he give an account thereof on the day of judgment. By the word, by the way, that's a scary thought. You're going to give account for everything that came out of your mouth. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and he said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there should be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repent, they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus is saying, you guys are without excuse because you literally have the Son of God among you. And you still won't repent. Nineveh repented when they just heard the preaching of Jonah. So they'll be condemning this generation. Verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment. This generation shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And then he makes that statement about the unclean spirits. In verse 43, he says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. You see, the unclean spirit is always looking for a place to indwell. And this is just a theory of mine. Okay? I lean towards the belief that everybody will be possessed with something everyone either you'll be possessed by demonic spirits or you'll be possessed or indwelled by the spirit of god and if you don't have the spirit of god in you then and you're especially if you're allowing these influences in your life you're gonna be (laughs) you're gonna bring in something he says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of the man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. You know, seeking for a place to, to dwell. And he find he findeth none. Then he says, I will return to the house from whence I came. And when he's come out, he will find it empty, swept, and garnished. So the house was cleaned out. Got rid of the wicked spirit, but didn't fill it with the truth of God. Didn't fill it with God. So he comes and he finds it completely empty. He says, fine, I'm going to go get seven more spirits that, that are more wicked than myself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so, it shall be to this ge- wicked generation. So Jesus is using that truth and describing the generation of his, of his day to that truth. We often see this with drug addicts or alcoholics and, and things like that, right? Like they'll get clean but then they'll fall off, and then they're worse off than they were before, right? You know, going back to this idea that the United States was a Christian nation, and when I say Christian nation, I'm not talking about uh, theocracy. But Christian, was, we had Christian principles that our laws and our morals as a society were grounded in. Even though many of the founders were Freemasons and all those things, I get that. But they understood an important concept, which is that if they rooted our laws and rooted the people in, in, with Christian foundations, that the, that the country would be blessed and it would prosper. And what happened is you had the, one of the most blessed, if not the most blessed, the most prosperous and most powerful country in modern history as a result of that. Now they're trying to tear it down. And they're bringing in 
what they consider Babylon. And I say they because this isn't an argument about our argument about whether or not America or New York City is Mystery Babylon. I would argue that th- at the very least they think that it's Babylon. I don't know if you've seen uh, the artwork for that movie that uh, I believe came out a few days ago, um, starring a bunch of you know famous people, Brad Pitt, that Margaret. Margaret Robbie and the name of the movie is Babylon and you can tell by the trailer and everything that it's going to be filled with all types of symbolism and perversions and all kinds of madness but the cover art for the movie is the actress in a scarlet dress with a bunch of hands reaching up to her Um, There's a couple. There's one where she's being pushed through the crowd and there's all kinds of crazy symbolism in the the backdrop. And again, she's in that scarlet dress. These people believe in this stuff. Maybe some of you will remember, it wasn't that long ago, just a few years ago when they projected all those gods on on the skyscraper in New York City. Do you remember that? If you're watching a YouTube video, I'm, I'm going to just show it as I'm talking about it. And they were projecting all those different gods on there. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, just a few years ago, that they had the replica of the Arch of Baal that went around the world and was in New York City. Remember that? So I don't need to argue whether or not, you know, there's a lot of things about Mystery Babylon that doesn't fit the United States at all. Or or a city in the United States. There's a lot of things that do, but I think it'd be I think it's pretty easy to argue that at the very least they believe that and they use that symbolism. They use the Babylonian symbolism of the Scarlet Woman and all that stuff. Uh, they just what, what was it like last year? They had that beast out in front of the UN building. Some of you probably remember that. What I'm talking about there. Um. Halftime show, Katy Perry rides in on a beast. She's wearing a scarlet dress. I mean, you surely you guys remember these things. You know, if you go to Revelation 17, when it first starts really talking about this, it says, And there came out of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you the, the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness, and I saw the woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names, blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having the golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was the name written, Mystery Babylon the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Like I said, there's things that that don't fit. If you were a Christian in one of those seven churches that the book of Revelation was delivered to, you would have very likely and very easily and probably rightfully so at that time found Rome in this description. And let's not forget that Revelation was written to seven literal churches of John's day. So it's, I'm not, right now I'm not trying to make an argument about that other than to say they are pulling these things and doing some weird type of worship towards Babylon and towards these gods, which are really just demonic presences manifesting as these gods that they worship. We're living in some really, really strange times. You know, Peter talks about kind of the same stuff uh, that we just read in Matthew. And uh, if you go to Second Peter chapter 2, I'm just going to scroll down. He says, In verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, so it's that same concept, they escape the pollutions. 
And they do it through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And then they are again entangled and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to, after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And he says, But as it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed in her wallowing of mire. Same principle here, I believe, that Peter's talking about. It's like you get you, you, you escape those filths and you turn to the Lord. But then you get entangled again in those filthy, evil things and those sins. And then you're worse off than you were before you even came to Christ. And it would have been better off if you had not known the way of righteousness, Peter says, than to have known it and then reject it later. You see, here's the biggest problem with America. It's that we had the gospel. It was, it was taught in our schools, in our universities, in our, our, our government officials respected it at one point. And then in the 60s, we, you know, people will use the phrase, we decided to kick God out which I always find as a, as a ridiculous phrase, as if anybody kicks God out of anything. What actually happened is we decided that we didn't want the truth anymore. We wanted to replace it with man's wisdom. We wanted to replace it with pleasure. And so, as the scriptures say, we refused to retain God in our knowledge and as a result, God has given us over to those things. And if you look at the state of it now, every rotten thing, every wicked thing, every filth has been embraced, has been called good, We have become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, as Revelation 18 says. I don't have time to get into it this morning, but I wrote an article that I haven't published yet. I wrote it a few weeks ago. I've just been kind of sitting on it, deciding if I want to dare publish it. But it's an article where I go into detail and I really blame the church for the state that we're in right now. And how if the church would act right, if the church would walk out what it claims it believes, if the church would live out what the Bible actually says, things would be different. I mean, the answer to the demonic force is that which is more powerful, which is the truth of God. But if we, ref if we continue to refuse, like if even the church refuses to retain the truth and the knowledge of God, how then can we expect society to be impacted at all? If it's not the real gospel, the truth, and I'm talking about the actual gospel, which includes the message of obedience. If that's not going out, then... Don't expect culture to be impacted at all. You see, the church isn't trying to impact culture so much as it wants to be like culture. That's the message that you hear so often is, oh, we want to be relevant so we can get the people in the building. Well, yeah, they come into your building. And they listen to 20 minutes of rock music and a 30-minute motivational speech, and they walk out as lost and dead as they were before they came in, maybe worse off now because they think they have some type of religion, but they don't have a faith that saves because they don't even know the truth, and you're not teaching them how to even obey it and to walk it out. And that is how we end up in the condition that we're in. Yes, there's a spiritual war going on, 
and there's people doing evil things. But very few have resisted it. Very few will put their necks out there and talk about this stuff and say, this is what's happening and it's wrong. Cowardness. Well, I'm out of time, and uh, this is one of those podcasts where I'm like, do I dare publish this? Because I feel like I've just done nothing but ramble and everything's been off the cuff, but we'll just see how it goes. And hopefully God's will will be done with this work. Next week, I plan to resume back to our normal Bible studies as usual. Uh, It's just been a weird week. (laughs) I pray that you've been blessed. And uh, listen, your support is much needed. It's just getting harder and harder. Um, the the censorship is, it gets, continues to get worse. The odds of being able to sustain these type of things is getting harder and harder. And the support uh, is harder to come by. So please consider supporting this work. And praying for me. And praying for this podcast. Thanks for listening. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time. God bless.